So, I'm going to talk about talk about batteries today, and we all know that batteries are important for an obvious obvious reasons, right? We all move want to move towards renewable sources of energy, but what happens when the sun doesn't shine and wind doesn't blow? We need energy storage devices to store and host energy, right? And at the same time, we need uh, laptops and cell phones which are long-lasting, safer, and low cost. And we are all running into trouble with that. So just imagine when one day we use the same battery chemistry in these mega structures like car, robotics, or even aeroplanes. So there is a problem, right? And I claim that we know how to solve that problem. We have to move towards a different battery chemistry. This chart here shows uh, the different types of battery chemistry and the maximum energy density. There are lots of points in this chart, but I just want you to focus on two point points, the black star and the red star. The black star is the commonly used lithium ion battery, which is in the laptops and cell phones, and the red star is the, is the future, lithium oxygen battery. And both of these batteries utilizes lithium ions as charge carrier. Then what makes the lithium oxygen battery so much more powerful compared to the lithium ion battery? For that, we have to look what's inside. In a lithium ion battery, there is a graphite-based anode which intercalates lithium ions. And on the cathode side, there is a lithium-based compound. However, in a lithium oxygen battery, we just throw away the graphite. And instead, we just have a lithium metal. And in doing so, we save a lot of weight in the anode side. And the energy density of the anode can be increased by even 10 times. And since we have, we have a lithium source in the anode, we don't need to use a lithium compound in the cathode. So one, so one can use simple molecules like oxygen, sulfur, and so forth. And in that, in that way, the overall energy density is very high. But like any other engineering devices, the lithium oxygen battery also has advantages and disadvantages. Perhaps the greatest advantage is that the energy density in city is so high that it's even comparable to that of gasoline. So they are the, they are the right choice for uh, electric vehicles. In terms of the disadvantage, it can be divided into the anode problems and the cathode problems. And I want to start by talking about the lithium metal anode first. Uh, again, in a lithium metal battery, there is a lithium lithium anode, and there is a uh, cathode on the other side. And in the metal, metal, we have a liquid electrolyte, which transfers ions from one side to another, to another. And also, there is a plastic sheet of paper, which is called the separator, which prevents any ele electrical connection between the two sides. During the battery operation, the lithium ion goes and deposits on the lithium anode during the charge cycle. And, du and during this charge, the lithium ion goes and reacts on the cathode side. And you would want this to happen over and over again for hundreds of thousands, thousands hundreds or thousands of cycles. But you would find that during this charging process, the lithium ion deposits as rough structures on the anode. And these are, these are called dendrites. And these dendrites can easily pierce through the plastic sheet of paper, paper the separator, and ultimately touch the counter electrode to cause a short circuit. circuit. Typically, the common electrolytes used in these, ba these batteries are flammable in nature. So any short circuit generates an ohmic heat. And that ohmic heat results in fire and explosion. In fact, th this dried growth is not only seen in lithium, <laughs> But also, it's common, common in other forms of metals like zinc, copper, and so forth. However, something which is very interesting is that magnesium doesn't form dendrites. And this is, this is where we got interested in. So we thought that the dendrite growth is, growth is not an intrinsic property of the metal. There is something fundamental going on in the interface. And to know why these dendrites form, let's get a closer look at the, at the lithium uh, electrolyte interface. Here, I am, I am saying that lithium metal, in presence of any electrolyte, reacts to form a passivating layer called the solid electrolyte interface. And this, and this solid electrolyte interface is very inhomogeneous in nature. So, so, some parts are more conducting, some parts are less. And the ions selectively deposit on the regions with higher ionic conductivity. 
form these sh sharp nuclei. And once these nuclei are formed, it's a cascade effect from there because the local electric field at the tip of the of these nuclei is very high. So the ions tend to continuously deposit at the tip of tip of these nuclei, and these nuclei turn into dendrites, that short cell. Right? So overall, what I'm saying here is that there are two uh, forms of instabilities. The chemical instability due to the reaction at surface and the mechanical instability due to the growth of dendrite. And my PhD research was understanding these of instabilities and trying to find out the fundament fundamental reasons why they occur and how to stop them. O overall, my PhD can be divided into three major themes. Uh, number one is designing polymer, polymer grafted nanoparticles, understanding their structure and rheology. Number two, number two is un understanding the ion transport in this nanoporous media, and, num and number three is understanding the ion transport at electrode-electrolyte interface. But for the interest of time, I'm, I'll just focus on the last two themes. Okay, so let's come back to the same picture. I'll start by talking, ab talking about the mechanical instability or the dendrite growth. So the, mo the most common way of preventing this dendrite from growing is to is to block them, right? If you have a very high modest barrier, then the dendrite won't right, won't be able to cross over. So, and this is a very interesting chemical engineering engineering problem: is that what is the optimum modulus that is required to prevent the dendrites from growing? And, and like any other chemical engineer, we started by writing the ion transport, transport equation. So here, uh, we write the ion transport transport equation by simple mass conservation where the subscript C, C is for the cations and A is for the anions. Uh, so the, the, to the total flux is the summation of the diffusion, the electro migration, and the, and the third pressure term, which is there because of the stress, ge stress generated by dendrites on the separator, that creates a strain field driving the ions from the tip, the tip to the valley. So these equations you may have seen in your uh, chemical engineering, engineering classes. The only difference here is that this, uh, th th these materials are charged, so they are ions. They are in an electric field, so we write, we write a Poisson equation uh, for that. After writing the ion, tra ion transport equation, we perform linear stability analysis of the interface between, between the electrolyte and the electrode. So this is the perturbation equation for that. that. There are two important terms in this perturbation equation, sigma that captures the growth rate and k which is the inverse nuclear, uh, nucleate size or, size or the wave number of the perturbation. Then we solve uh, uh, the ion transport equation to finally plot uh, the, the non-dimensional growth rate as a function of inverse nucleate size. It's very easy to, re easy to read this graph. If uh, the sigma, sigma is zero or negative, then the deposit happens in the, in the valleys. If it's, it's more than zero, then there is instability. Okay. So you can see that at a modulus of about one gigapascal, uh, all of the modes are stable. So there is an answer. If if the modulus of the electrolyte is about one gigapascal, then you can stop you can stop the dendrite. But this modulus is so high that even the, even the ion transport would be impeded. So you have to operate these batteries at high temperature. And, and obviously no one wants a hot phone in the pocket. Right? So we thought th this in a little different way. If you see here, beyond this crit critical uh, size, all modes are stable. What this is saying, saying here is that if the size of the nucleate is very small, then the surface tension domin dominates and it prevents the bump from growing. So in other words, if we design a nanoporous separator such that the size of the, size of the pore in the separator is smaller than the critical nucleate size, then we will, then we will always end stability. And the ions can easily, easily flow in pores, but it will at the same time block the dendrites. Right? And for that, we designed the cross-linked hairy nanoparticle membrane as, show, as shown here. This was done by grafting PEO chains on silica nanopart nanoparticles and then cross-linking them with uh, polypropylene oxide to form these uh, macrostructures. 
Here I am showing in the TEM micrograph graph of this membrane, which shows that the particles are well separated from each other and the, and the interparticle distance here is about 25 nanometers. We performed perform small X-ray scattering on this membrane and here I am showing you the scattered intense intensity as a function of the wave vector. We have fitted uh, uh, the experimental, da experimental data with, the, uh, with an unified BUKH model it shows that the particles are arranged in some like fashion. At the same time, this membrane is flex flexible and also it can soak enough electrolyte to serve as a composite, composite electrolyte in a battery to be created at room temperature. Okay, okay. So this nanoporous uh, separator acts, acts as a model uh, nanoporous media because the silica nanoparticle here act as, as blocking edge for the dendrites, but the ions can flow in the pores. Also, one can easily tune the pore size of this membrane by change, changing the volume fraction of the nanoparticle in the membrane, right? So now, to test, to test out the hypothesis whether this the nanostructure membrane prevents dend dendrite, we designed a very simple experimental setup. And this is, this is a symmetric lithium cell where both the electrodes are made of lithium and you can cure favorite electrolyte in the middle. And in this experiment, we charge and discharge the battery over and over again at, at, a, at a constant current density, get this voltage profile. And you find that if there, if there is a short circuit or if the dendrite grows and both sides, sides are touching, then there is an electrical connection. So the distance will immediately drop, which you can see, you can see uh, there will be a drop and you will find out that this is the short circuit time of this electrolyte. electrolyte. And you can use the short, short circuit time as the figure of merit, merit to test up the different electrolytes. With this experimental setup, we, we started by understanding the short circuit time of a conventional electrolyte as here, as here, which shows that at this current density, the battery fails in, ab in about 60 hours. Now, if we use the, the, po the polymer, gra polymer grafted nanoparticle membrane, the battery is able to cycle stably for, for 500 hours or more. So, at this point, I am showing you result uh, from black box. We are not, we don't know what's, hap what's happening inside the battery. We, all we know is that we have this short circuit time and there is no short circuit with the membrane, but there is a short circuit with the electrolyte. But we, we wanted to do more. We wanted to know what's exactly happening at the interface. How's the structure of the, de the deposits and so forth. And for that, we, des we designed uh, this electrochemical cell with a glass window where you can direct, directly visualize the lithium deposition uh, during the operation. This comprises, comprises of symmetric lithium cell. So on the left, I'm going to, I'm going to show you uh, in situ visualization of electro deposition, a commercial separator. And on the right, I'm going to show you the results with the cross-linked nanoparticle membrane. membrane. So you would see that the current used here is much higher, bigger, because in this case, we don't want to cycle battery. We want to know when this the model fail, and what is the limitation of this model, and so forth. So, so you can see that during the deposition, the deposits are very very rough. They are they are dendritic in nature. They are able to grow through, and over time, this will this will grow and ultimately touch the counter electrode to cause a short circuit. Right, right. However, in case of the cross-linked hadino particles, the deposits are limited in this cross section. It's not able to go through. So this, so this membrane acts like an invisible barrier for the dendrites from, dendrites from growing across. But at the same time, there is deposition. So we can know that the, the, ions, the ions are flowing in the pores of this membrane. Right? So now to test, to test out the model, we uh, designed a, mem a membrane with pore size of 500 nanometer by tuning the volume fractions of, of the nanoparticle in the membrane. And here is the result. You would see that the dendrites are able to grow, to grow through the gel-like membrane, and uh, just like the commercial shell separator. So we did this with a bunch of different uh, uh, size by, by changing the volume fraction, uh, and recorded, plotted the, the deposits at different times, uh, and finally plotted the growth rate of, of the dendrite as a function of pore size. What you are seeing here is that at 
pore size below 5 500 nanometers the dendrites are not able to grow through but beyond, beyond that there is positive growth rate of the dendrites so at this current density if you design a membrane where the pore size size is smaller than 500 nanometers then the dendrite won't be able to grow through and from pressure from the linear stability analysis theory, uh, uh, this pore size at the current density would be about 1.2 mic microns. So overall, important takeaway points from this part of my talk is that is that for continuum analysis you can find novel techniques of enabling high in high energy density batteries, and also you can inhibit mechanical mechanical instability by designing in uh, nanopore separators. Now, this is is great and we are able to stop the dendrites from growing through through but if you have worked with lithium metal you would think that this is not enough enough for enabling lithium metal batteries there is a much bigger problem which is related with chemical reactions of the lithium metal with with any electrolyte a previous researcher said that lithium is thermodyna thermodynamically un unstable any kind of organic solvents so you you have a electrolyte it will react the lithium metal form different species species uh, at the interface and people have found that uh, this solid electrolyte electrolyte interface have, uh, uh, has different types of salts and and small polymers like lithium oxide lithium fluoride and so on and so forth so the question that i wanted to answer here is that how does the relative composition position of the chemical species affect the ion transport at the interface? For that, we perform DFT calculations uh, 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 by finding out the stable surface. So here, uh, at the top, I'm showing you the stable surface surface of lithium. At the bottom, it's for the magnesium. And we mapped out the binding energy of the ions on the surface. So the darker regions here, here represent the high binding energy and the lighter regions are uh, uh, the low binding energies. So the lithium ions are, are, uh, will, will tend to uh, deposit on the regions with darker color. And, and so we defined a new term here, which is the surface diffusion barrier, which is the energy, energy required for ions to hop from one stable region to another. And here I am plotting the surface diffusion barrier for different types of metals. What we found here is that the surface diffusion barri barrier or magnesium electrode is much, much lower than lithium or sodium. So that in a way explains why magnesium doesn't form, doesn't form dendrites while lithium or sodium does. What happens here is that if, if the surface diffusion barrier uh, is high, higher, then the ions would tend to deposit along the field lines to form these sharp, sharp nuclei. However, if the surface diffusion barrier is lower, the ions can easily migrate on the surface and it will, it will deposit in much flatter manner like that. But as I, pre as I previously mentioned, lithium is not always lithium at the interface. It, re it reacts with the electrolyte to form different species. So we carry out this DF DFT calculations for many different uh, salts, including, including the commonly found uh, salts at the interface, like the carnate, oxide, fluoride, fluoride and so forth. And something interesting that we found is that the surface diffusion, diffusion barrier is much higher for lithium carbonate and oxides, which are the typical, typical SCA for, uh, forming salts. So if you have, have, so the typical electrolytes people use in the in batteries are based on organic carbonates. So they react with the lithium metal to generate carbonates and oxide, which have very high, sur high surface diffusion barrier, and that's why the dendrites are formed. However, interestingly, we found that all halide salts have very low surface diffusion barrier. And barrier. So what it's saying here is that if we have halide salt, salt at the interface, then the surface diffusion barrier would be much, low, much lower, and you can have stability. So now to test out this, Hypothesis for the DFT calculations, we performed direct visualization experiment, experiment. And in this case, we did not use a separator uh, to stop the, stop the dendrite. So uh, on the left, I'm going to show you the, re the results with uh, commonly used organic carbonate. 
uh, uh, so it's expected that there is lot of lithium carbonate formed at the surface. So you see that the dendrites are mossy in nature. They grow at a very, very fast rate. So just imagine having this in your battery phone uh, of your cell phone. However, if we add about 10% of, li of lithium fluoride additive, then you would find that the deposit deposition is much more stable. And so very small, very small change in the electrolyte recipe can lead to big differences in the electro deposition. Right? So if we refer back to the same uh, uh, graph, then you would find that lithium bromide instead have very low surface diffus diffusion barrier. In fact, it's even similar to that of, of magnesium. So, so we added this lithium bromide additive and tried to understand the, understand the electro deposition with that. You would see that the deposition, deposition is much more stable and it's, it's stable even without a presence uh, of well, any uh, separator. So the growth rate, growth rate indeed follows the trend as predicted from the EFT calculations. So here I'm plotting the growth rate as a function of different uh, uh, AI, including, including carbonate, chloride, and bromide, where you can see it follows the very similar, very similar trend. Now to understand how does this molecular scale calculation really actually affects uh, the macro scale deposition, we made this uh, uh, simple model here wrote the over, over potential as a summation of the activation over potential due to the reaction of lithium plus going plus going to lithium uh, the interfacial diffusion the diffusion the interface and also the surface tension and this model was, was uh, obtained from the Batten and Bockris paper and we added a simple term of, of the surface diffusion which is the, the diffusion on the surface now now uh, to find out the most probable deposit size, we minimized it the, the over potential. And by making an assumption that the surface, the contribution from the surface diff diffusion is higher than the, the deposit, the, the diffusi diffusivity in the interface, we can find that the size of the nucleate uh, is an exponential function of the activation uh, barrier. Now, now here I am showing you the dimensionless uh, less growth as a function of the dimensionless uh, diffusion barrier. Here the diffusion barrier was, barrier was obtained from DFT calculation and it scaled with KT, KT and the growth rate is scaled with uh, the current, current at which it was deposited. So you can see that it indeed follows this exponential trend as, pred as predicted from the model. So the important takeaway from this part, part is that uh, halide salt enhance the stability of electro deposition in lithium lithium and we have also done experiment with sodium as same principle works and also also this the quantum calculation indeed reveal why magnesium doesn't form dendrites and dendrites and that can translate it to lithium metal batteries as well so uh, so this is about the lithium metal now lithium lithium oxygen is pretty difficult because the oxygen cathode is much more, much more complicated than the lithium metal anode because of electrochemistry. Uh, in a lithium oxygen battery, lithium ions react with the uh, uh, oxygen molecules to form lithium peroxides and it's expected that, it, that in the recharge cycle, the lithium peroxide will back to oxygen and lithium ions, right? Just like in, like in any rechargeable batteries. However, uh, in once this lithium peroxide molecules are formed, they are so insu insulating in nature that they totally uh, cover the entire surface of the cathode. So they block the electronic and ionic transport. Uh, so, so it would lead to uh, low conductivity and the battery would, won't be able to recharge back. Previously, some re researchers uh, the, did calculations to find, to find that if someone has high donor number electrolyte or electrolytes which are basic in nature, in nature th this problem can be solved. Because in this high donor number, donor number electrolytes, uh, lithium peroxide are formed through a different route, route where it uh, first forms a lithium a superoxide peroxide molecule which can be solvated in that electrolyte. So they go bigger in size, in size in the electrolyte before saturating on the cathode surface. So if you do that, do that, then the size of lithium peroxide would be much bigger. 
so it won't won't completely saturate the surface right? so that's uh, that's the prediction from the from the theory however uh, this high dura number ele number electrolytes for example dmac is very very reactive in nature in nature so it reacts with the lithium metal anode uh, aggressively so uh, uh, the lithium metal anode fails and if if you are able to, if you're using this kind of kind of electrolyte then battery will fail because of the reactions between the lithium the lithium metal and the electrolyte so we go back to the same problem that the lithium metal is very reactive even if we if we have a solution at using the high number solver uh, 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 stabilizer lithium oxygen so we came up with a solution here we thought let's use a layer of fixed anion to to coat the lithium metal anode the question is how does this fixed anion, anion layer stabilizes the lithium metal uh, there there has been some very interesting uh, new research uh, uh, where it shows that uh, if salt concentration in the electrolyte is very high, then it doesn't react the lithium metal. So what happens here is that uh, uh, the solvent molecules start to coordinate with the salt salt molecules. So if you keep on increasing the salt content in the electrolyte at certain point of time. All the salt molecules will start to coordinate with the solvent molecules, and uh, uh, since if all the salt molecules are, co are coordinated, the chemical potential for the reaction between the anode and the electrolyte goes to very high value. So, so at these high concentration electrolytes, the lithium metal won't react uh, uh, with the electrolyte. What we thought here is that we don't want very high high salt concentration in the bulk electrolyte. If we just have high salt concentration right at the interface, then it can solve the problem, right? Because that's where everything react, reacts. So this is how uh, a layer of, layer of fixed anion at the interface prints side reactions. So here, uh, uh, on, on the right, I'm showing you the lithium metal anode, right? And this is the anionic interface on the anode, and this is the bulk electrolyte. In, in the bulk electrolyte, all lithium ions are solvated by these uh, electrolyte molecules. And once th they go towards the lithium metal, metal they desolvate in this interfacial layer. So the solvent molecules leave uh, uh, the, li uh, the lithium ions. The lithium ions can prefer preferentially go towards the lithium metal. Right? Right? And this desolvation would be higher if, th if this interfacial layer is anionic in nature. And due to electrostatic, this desolvation would be higher. higher. Right? So if you have a layer of anionic interface, the lithium ions, lithium ions can preferentially go towards the lithium metal and solvent molecules won't be able to react with the, lith with the lithium metal. So let's look at it in this way. Uh, wh what I'm saying here is that we have a lithium metal anode and then there is an interface and then, and then there is an electrolyte. So just imagine this as uh, uh, two, regi two registers in series where the ion current is, is like the ions are m moving in the, bul in the bulk and then again in the interface. So in the bulk, bulk, all the ionic species are free to move and even the salt molecules. But in this interfacial layer, only lithium ions are able to uh, move, right? So we, so we are leaving all solvent molecules out. So if this is, this is right, then this can be proved using a concept called the transference number. The transference, transference number is defined as the ratio of, of the the current carried carried by the cations divided by the total current shown here. So, if uh, we have an anionic interface on on the electrode, then the transference number should go to a very high value because remember, remember these are like two registers in series. One register is in the interface, and the second is in the bulk. So, this chart here uh, shows the lithium transference number versus versus the I conductivity. There are lots of points again here, but let's focus on two points, uh, the black circle and the red circle. The black circle is, is with a neat electrolyte, a neat carbonate waste electrolyte. And then we use the, we use the same electrolyte and just put a layer of anions uh, on, the, on the lithium metal surface. And we, we saw that the transference number increases, increases a lot, which means that this layer is rectifying in the ion uh, movement. movement. So overall summary here is that 
uh, through prefer preferential transport of lithium ions in the interface, one can stabilize uh, electro deposition of uh, lithium metal, even with reactive electrolytes. Now, the question, the question is, how do we form this anionic interface on the lithium metal and metal anode? For that, we utilized a very simple additive, which we named as, as the ionomer additive. We add this in the electrolyte to light, and the expectation is this ionomer additive will directly, directly react with the surface lithium to form lithium brom bromide and also this organometallic uh, salt. As I previously mentioned, lithium bromide uh, leads to formation of com compact electro deposits, and uh, this autometallic salt will, salt will prevent the state reactions between the electrolyte and the metal. And when I said rational design, in this is what I meant. With one single additive, we can stabilize, stabilize the lithium metal with two different physics. And now to test out that we are actually actually forming this ionomer based interface. We performed XPS analysis that looks at the binding energies of different atoms at the surface. So, so at the top, I'm showing you the results for uh, the, the, the base with the ionomer, ionomer, and here I'm showing you the, the result without the ionomer. So you can clearly see formation of LIC bond here, which is present in this, pro this product, and also formation of LIBR. So we can confirm that we are, we are actually generating these chemical species at the interface. But again, again, we want to go one step further. We want to actually see how does the interfa interface look, what is the thickness, and so forth. Right? For that, we utilized a, test, a technique called cryo-FIB SEM. This is the same technique that got Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize earlier this year. In this technique, we used a focused ion, ion beam in cryo temperatures, negative 150 degrees Celsius, to cut through the sample, the sample, and then use a secondary electron source to look at the inter interface. And this is all done in, in cryo temperatures. So we don't have, don't have uh, to um, operate these vacuums, so we can actually see the frozen electrolyte. Here I'm showing you the cross section of the electrolyte and electrode, where the top part is the, the frozen electrolyte, and the bottom is the lithium metal anode. anode. In the middle, you can see this 15 nanometer thick ionomer interface. And you can estimate the concentration of the salt in this, in this interface be about 20 molar. Now, again, to, ten, to test out the hypothesis that whether the this ionomer interface stabilizes the lithium metal deposit, we designed a, a simple setup. setup. Here, we designed a battery with one side lithium metal, and on the other side, we have stainless steel electrode. Okay. And the electrolyte that we use here is a DMAC, DMAC with lithium nitrate, which is very, very reactive in nature. In this experiment, experiment we just deposit a very a small amount of lithium from lithium from the lithium electrode to the stainless steel side, okay, and, and then just observe the voltage profile and so forth. So here in this ex this experiment, this is uh, what we input. We have a constant current at one milliampere per centimeter square square, and we operate that for ten hours, and then keep the battery at rest. And this is the voltage profile that we obtain. The a curve is the voltage profile of the control electrolyte without the ionomer additive, additive a black is with the ionomer additive. What we find, we find here is that uh, the over potential of the position with the, con with the control electrolyte is much higher because of the uh, side reactions and the interfacial resistance is higher. But something very interesting happens after that. As soon as I stop the current, the, current, the voltage of the control uh, battery rises up. So now, a uh, lithium versus lithium battery should have a, poten a potential difference of zero volt because there is no difference between the two sides. But if it's, it's one side lithium and another side stainless steel, the potential will be higher, right? So it all, both of them starts with a higher uh, potential where one side is lithium and lithium and one side is stainless steel. But when, when we stop the current, the potential differential difference is zero for the ionomer additive, which means that we are actually depositing lithium uh, uh, on the stainless steel, but for the control electrolyte, as soon as we deposit, all the, all the metal react. So it goes back to the stainless steel. 
uh, form. Now, to convince you further, we performed uh, post-mortem post analysis of the stainless steel electrode after deposition, where on the, on the left, uh, you can see that uh, there are very, very few, few deposits, and you can see the bare stainless steel. And on the right, with the ionomer, ionomer additive, the deposits are smooth, compact, and even the unif uniform in size shape. Okay, so uh, using this ionomer, ionomer additive, uh, we operated the lithium oxygen oxygen battery, and we can uh, cycle the cell. So the overall overall takeaway message from this part is that thermodynamic instability really drives the side reactions between lithium surface uh, and the electrode, and also and having interfacial layer of anions at the surface of lithium lithium. Uh, prevents the side reactions between the electrolyte and uh, an electrode. So the overall message from uh, my talk is that uh, through rational design of electrolyte and uh, inter interfaces, one can stabilize these high energy density batteries. And all these rational designs, designs are based on chemical engineering principles like transport and, thermo and thermodynamics. With that, I would like to Thank Mank, my advisor, Mr. Lyndon Archer, uh, all my curators and Archer group members. Thank you for listening. There are many different ways of doing that, and like. Uh, uh, so when we started this work, we started by uh, adding uh, halide salt, salt in the electrolyte, which are not very soluble in nature. So uh, like that's how we got started. But, but then we were depositing by side, rea side reaction. So lithium is very reactive. It will react with anything. So you can make the lithium react with, com with compounds like, for example, FEC, ethylene carbonate, which will generate lithium right at the surface. So that is another way of doing it. Another way is by, is by sputtering this salt right at the surface of the lithium. There are many different ways. And, uh, and, uh, and all these principles, what we have found is that it's not like what we're trying to do is say that, OK, use this material, and this will, this will is going to, going to stabilize. We are going to work a way to understand why something should work and what kind of same type, same type of material should work out. So in literature, there are many, many electrolytes which uh, gener uh, generate lithium fluoride by itself and that's how they stabilize the surface what we found so the overall answer is like there is no one material you can ger generate in any uh, any way but uh, but the important thing is it should have high content of halide at the surface do you ever do experiments where you have a Uh, to find out the thickness of the layer or how much is present. present. Yeah, uh, I'm curious because, I mean, if you have two lithium electrodes, yeah. you have, you know, infinite capacity based right. on the thickness, the thickness of those electrodes. So, uh, I, I just wonder if adding that layer, layer is actually changing the chemistry of the battery completely, completely, so that it's no longer lithium metal, lithium metal, but lithium metal in your, your layer, and it's just charging, charging and discharging that layer. Yeah, so you can, cal can calculate the capacity of this uh, of this interfacial layer, and it would come down come down to be a very low value because it's like few nanometers compared to this full lithium metal. But one way to test up like how much capacity is that uh, is there is by doing by doing uh, uh, cyclic voltammetry to look at the peaks, and we've done that not with these materials, but so there is another interest in our lab of making making this hybrid anodes where you have lithium metal and then you have a layer of tin and tin can also intercalate lithium so that that's that's exactly what you were saying so in so in, in that kind of technique uh, the tin uh, surf, uh, the tin interface will intercalate lithium ions and it will it will uh, it will just pass on to the lithium metal. and we have done, we have done cyclic voltmetry to understand what is the thickness uh, what is the capacity of that and it comes down to a very low value Mm 
い。So, uh, our one, so personal, my personal, personal target is to understand like the range of different materials that work. So, uh, so uh, like I use silica graft nanoparticles uh, as just as just a choice, and other choice could be like nanoporous alumina, for example, or something else. Something else. So you can change the pore size, and this is like uh, what I would I think is an universal universal thing that you have a porous separator with smaller pore size, and it can still prevent dendrites from growing. So, so one advantage of using this polymerized uh, membranes or separators is it's easier to scale up, scale up compared to ceramics. So that that's also there. And since the so lithium metal batteries are a little different from lithium ion batteries because of the of the volume expansion, which is very very high. So you deposit you can deposit any amount of lithium on the surface, face, and we keep depositing, and it will increase the volume. So it can still break, break apart. Uh, the whatever interface is there, so there is always a challenge when when scaling up these lithium metal batteries in large scale. So there is always a problem. But I think this f field is at its uh, beginning at this point and can be done a lot more in future. In future. I, th I think that's a very good question, especially consider considering that the interfaces are so complicated. And lithium metal battery, I mean, there's, I mean, there's a fun fact: that the lithium metal batteries were invented even before the lithium, the lithium ion batteries. And then people thought, oh, we cannot deal with this, so they moved on. And so because, like, like the till the interface is still a mystery. You change something, the interface will change, will change, change an electrolyte, the interface will change, the reaction will change, and it, and it can lead to many different outcomes. So, but we're starting to get some information of how how does these component work, how does that component work. What we cannot handle at this point, this point is that, again, lithium fluoride, for example. I mean, it's very very difficult to have just a monolayer of lithium fluoride, no other salt. So it would it would be interesting to find out like how does the combination of different salt, different polymers, really affect the full battery performance. So I, I I'm not sure. How the machine, learn, machine learning would exactly work on that, but it definitely make the life of the experiment experimentalist much easier. I would say, especially th thinking about the interfaces and how complicated they, they are. Right. Right. So I think there are two questions. So about cost. So actually, like like uh, we looked at like the different cost and transitioning for, from the lab to to industry scale. And like if you think like the common the battery at this point, the lithium lithium ion batteries, the the most the easiest way of like make like make uh, to get to a better battery at this point is through engineering principles. How to how to process it in easier way. Lithium metal is not that uh, 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 cheap. It's it's costly. And opportunities are huge. Like you can get like lot of lot of improvement. It cannot happen like in near future. And and the thing about the cost op optimization, it's a completely different research area. So 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 the, there can be a lot of work that can be done. And like I'm sure some engineering work works related to the amount of lithium in battery versus versus the lifetime. So like in in labs, we just use a lithium metal anode. As our as our electrode, but obviously, he, who wants to have a lithium metal in their phone? No, no one, one, one wants. Right. So 
the final goal of this project I see, like in, like in, I don't know, maybe 30 years, is that you don't have any electrode. Just imagine that you had, you have a stainless steel. So that's your electrode. You are just depositing lithium on, on that, and you are taking lithium out. So that's your electrode. So that would be really, really, really cheap compared to any electrode, because that's like an electrode-free battery, if you think. But that's really challenging, because lithium metal is so reactive, so it deposits a thin air, uh, and then it will immediately react, so you won't have anything left out. So, so there are a lot of, a lot of optimization and things that can be done. Uh, talking about this, the second question about the membrane, yes, you are, you are absolutely right. In fact, currently we are working on the crosslink PEO, PEO membrane where we crosslink the polymer chains using a UV light where we have um, methacrylate, acrylate groups that can crosslink uh, using anionic polymerization to form a membrane. And you can, and you can calculate the pore size you know, by doing DMA to look at, to look at the modulus and calculating the pore, effective pore size of this membrane. And that can work in a very similar way at the, as, the, as this crosslink heavy nanoparticles. Why I chose the crosslink nanoparticles because because I wanted to systematically change the pore size. That was much easier with the, nano, the nanoparticles, but definitely can be done with any other kind of materials.